Good morning. Great to be here. So as I mentioned, or as was just mentioned, I'm a professor in the School of Design. And I realize I'm talking about AI and machine learning on a campus and in a city full of more AI and machine learning people than you could expect per capita than just about anywhere. But I want to take a slightly different approach to it. As I mentioned, I'm a historian and a designer. And I want to see what we might learn and bring from design over to the field of AI. And I'm going to start by looking back. I mean, way, way back, like 3,000 years back. I want to start with the story of King Mu in China, about th in uh, 900 BC. And his friend, the artificer, an early designer named Yan Shi. And Yan Shi is an inventor, an artificer, again, who created a robot of sorts that he brought to the king's court. And he brought it in, and the robots the robot walked with confident strides. When Yan Shi touched the robot's chin, he sang and he gestured. And then when his performance was done, he started making moves toward the ladies. And this really made the king mad. And so the king said that Yan Shi should be executed on the spot. And um, Yan Shi, terrified, threw down the robot and started taking it apart and saying, look, look, this is how it's made. You can see it's leather, it's wood, it's paint, it's adhesive. And the king was very intrigued. And so he discovered that when he picked up the heart, the lips stopped moving. And when he took out the kidney, the robot couldn't walk. And the king thought this was fascinating. And he said, this says something great about our great author and the state of nature. And what I like so much about this story is that it says something about design and intelligence, that we make things by building them up. We make our own models of them. And we build them up, and then we take them apart only to build them back up again. Let me give you another example. This is a little more recent. This is 1739. It's known as the defecating duck. The defecating duck is a mechanical duck that does kind of what you'd expect. You put in grain, you turn a crank, and it defecates. But, but the reason that this is fascinating is that it was a model of automata. It was a model of artificial life. And by designing this, it was possible to come up with a way to see how life and how maybe intelligence just might work in this 18th century kind of way. But for us, it's a little more complicated these days when we want to look at models of artificial intelligence. When I put artificial intelligence into Google, I get images like this, the kind of cyborg-y, what is AI. Um, I like these, this sort of robot hand-holding, um, robots on the job site. can get other images like this. I think this might be jQuery, but I'm, I'm not sure. Not sure how intelligent that really is, but that's probably a different story. You see the dystopian images, right? You see the, the scary security camera and what could that mean? You see interfaces in a scary world like Minority Report. And um, you know the beautiful movements and translucency on one hand, but on the other, it's a really dark place. And if we're going to go dark and talk about movies and AI, we've got to go to HAL. HAL 9000, whose words, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that, terrified everybody. I won't leave you at dark. Um, we can also revisit some robot sidekicks. I'm of the age where number five is alive was actually something that we cared about. I suspect there are about five people in the room who know what I'm talking about. They're on the left with Ali Sheedy in Short Circuit. And maybe more of you know Marvin the Depressed Robot from reading The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books. Um, voiced in the more recent movie by Alan Rickman. But the question is, how do we get beyond the cliches? And here at CMU, there are interesting approaches to that question. Um, a lot of them happening here in HCI, for instance. Um, people like John Zimmerman and Jody Forlisi and Qian Yang are working on the question of how AI can become material for designers. And it's true, we need to find a way for AI to become material for designers. It's very difficult for them to get much work done in AI otherwise. But that's kind of not what I'm interested in. So I want to flip it around and say, what can design bring to AI? 
So I've got five provocations for you, five ideas that I think that AI and machine learning might be able to look over toward design and architecture and the way that we approach our, mo our modes of problem solving and um, make things real in the world. So the first one is constraints and context. I know that everybody out there who has ever done a design project really wants that blue sky. You know, all the money, best ever client, no client, coolest tech, you got it, biggest team. But the fact is, that's not how we work. We know that all design is about framing and reframing and constraints and context. It's about fitting things into boxes and pushing at the edges. And that is what makes really exciting design. Number two is visualization. Since the 1960s, architects have been visualizing the structure of design problems. If anyone here is familiar with Christopher Alexander, who later wrote the book A Pattern Language, he used math, he used graph theory and different visualization schemes to understand what complex design uh, problems were. We could take something like this. These are, this is some uh, code for uh, sorting algorithm vi visualization. And a lot of people in this room can look at the code in the comments and know totally what's going on. And a lot more people who are taking computer science right now um, are grappling with these algorithms on their own. I'm going to warn you, the next slide flickers a lot. So if you're someone who needs a moment to shield your eyes, please do that. But there's also this moment, this, this kind of way of visualizing a sorting algorithm. <laughs> Satisfying, isn't it? There you go. Oh, I'm still running it. There we go. But it's, it's a fascinating way to understand what the sorting algorithm is, that it's taking one from here and putting it at the end and, and vice versa, and then boom, level up to your next sorting algorithm. Um, this beautiful visualization is a visualization of galaxies. It's a visualization of neural nets, and it was an un, um, it was, uh, it's a, it's a visualization of a neural network and showing the relationships of information about galaxies. So the nodes um, that have heavier lines are more recent information. And then the older, the older material, as the um, algorithm parses it, is what falls away. Number three is transparency. The kind of design that we do um, and that we teach here at Carnegie Mellon is human-centered design. This is something that we're doing in the School of Design in our design research methods classes. And we go out and we try and figure out what people are really doing in the world. What, where do they work? Where do they live? What problems are they trying to solve? And I think that that kind of knowledge, if you bring it back to problems of artificial intelligence and data, start to help you with the problems of bias. So for instance, you could, you could better sort out the gender biases in corpuses of words. There was a recent situation, for example, with a, with a corpus of data that came from Google News. And you'd think that Google News might, well, maybe after fake news, you don't think this anymore. But Google News would have maybe less biased representations between words. But if you can think back to the kind of analogies that you would form, Paris is to France as Tokyo is to Japan. OK, fine, that makes sense. But man is to computer programmer as woman is to what? And this particular corpus produced homemaker. And that can be troubling. Um, so there, there are different ways to work against that. But one thing that we can begin to do is use some of the mechanisms that we use in design, whether design research and user-centered design methods, to surface and make things more transparent. The fourth is embodiment. And certainly the story of Yen Shi, the artificer, and the defecating duck are questions of embodiment, designers manifesting things in form and in mechanism. Uh, I like looking back to this example from Nicholas Negroponte who is the founder of the MIT Media Lab. And in a past life, before he did that, he founded something called the Architecture Machine Group. And he wrote a book called The Architecture Machine in 1970 that was a theory about artificial intelligence and design. He dedicated the book to the first machine that can appreciate the gesture. And he wrote something that I keep coming back to over and over and over again. 
He wrote, it is so obvious that our interfaces, that is our bodies, are intimately related to learning and to how we learn that one point of departure in artificial intelligence is to concentrate specifically on the interfaces. Does a machine need to have, possess a body like my own or be able to experience behaviors like my own in order to share in what we call intelligent behavior? While the answer may, be, while it may seem absurd, I believe the answer is yes. I think there's something there for us to consider in our relationship with ourselves and what we make in artificial intelligence in this old statement. And the fifth area is craft. Designers craft. So do coders. Lots of us craft. And a lot of times we think of craft as the guy with the crazy beard and the wood shop and all of the sandpaper and the lathe. Or maybe it's paper and tape and the exacto knife and the self-healing board and cutting something together and making something in that way. Or maybe it's using even the traditional tools from architecture, in this case, architectural drawing, that we start using as a method of craft. But then maybe we also look at how the algorithm can become craft itself. This is the newest Philharmonie. It's um, the Elbe Philharmonie in Hamburg, Germany, designed by Herzog and de Meuron, And it just opened in January 2017. And it's a beautiful, beautiful um, concert hall. But more notable, even, is the surfaces of the conference hall, uh, con concert hall. You'll notice that there are numerous little channels here. There are 10,000 individual panels, each of them individually determined through various algorithmic design choices. And moreover, it was done in, in concert, no pun intended, with Yoshisa Toyota, who's one of the world's greatest acoustic, a, acousticians. And they're individually placed around the conference hall, concert hall, to make a very, very special, um, special surface. I think it's worth noting that the last piece they played on opening night was Beethoven's Ode to Joy. You could imagine how it would ring in the air when they finished. So where does this leave us? Again, I keep coming back to old figures, people like Herb Simon and Alan Newell, who were on this very campus, and HJCR Licklider. And these, these three gentlemen did a lot to put in place paradigms for artificial intelligence that we still talk about today. They also believed it was going to be way easier to get it right. Simon and Newell believed in 1959 that they thought it would only be a couple years before they could completely model the human brain and solve the problems of artificial intelligence. J.C.R. Licklider, in 1960-61, wrote a piece called Man-Computer Symbiosis, and we still talk about human-computer human symbiosis as the desired end outcome for artificial intelligence. But we're still not there yet. And I think that if we're to look ahead to these different kinds of treatments and ideas that designers might be able to bring to the equation, that architects could bring to the equation, and that collaboration could, if we start looking at constraints and ways to frame problems, if we start looking at how we might visualize, ways that we could be ethical and transparent, if we started looking at different methods for, um, for crafting and different methods for bringing things to bear, I think we may be in a better place. Thank you. <laughs>